want to welcome you to I'm the Mama podcast. I'm your host, Ashley L., where we discuss the ins, the outs, and everything in between of motherhood, okay? Um, I hope that you all are having a fantastic day. And as always, y'all know I have to start off giving my shout outs to my mothers. And so I want to take some time to shout out to Tanya. She took the opportunity to make these beautiful, beautiful coasters that are amazing. They are perfect gifts. And, you know, it keeps my tables clean as well. (laughs) And so I wanted to be sure to shout out her for these amazing coasters. Thank you so much. And be sure to follow her. She does shipping as well. And so you can find her on IG at T Treasurers. That is T-E-E T-R-E-A-S-U-R-E-R-S treasurers. Okay. Be sure to follow her and hit her up so you can get you some nice coasters for these upcoming birthdays and holidays and things like that. All right. Now today our discussion is near and dear to me. Um, We are going to be talking about the importance of communicating with your little one. Now, anybody that knows me and for those who have been tuning into prior episodes, you know that I engage with my son on the regular. Uh, Since he was born, pretty much, I have always been talking to him the same way that I'm talking to you right now. I didn't do the Google goo -goo gagas and things like that. And in addition to that, I also took the time to teach him sign language because to me, it was important for him to be able to communicate with me, even though it may not have been verbal like we're doing so right now. So I want to take some time to welcome our guest of the day, Tambria Banks, she is a child and adolescent counselor specializing in reframing negative self-talk and improving emotional recognition and regulation. Her experience spans over 10 plus years in both early childhood education and counseling. Tambria is currently pursuing full license in the state of Georgia. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Tambria, for joining I'm the Mama podcast today. And just to give you a brief history of how Tambri and I met. So (laughs) we both go to the same amazing uh, stylist salon here in Atlanta. And Gabby does our hair. She does an amazing job on both of our hair. Gabby. Right. So the interesting thing is we just happened to be in the salon on the same day. And when I say the conversation just hit at first point and she hit it nail on in regards to the effective parts of communicating with your child, the do's and don'ts. And so I felt it's very important to bring her on just so that discussion is viral. So more of you mamas can hear about this awesome information that this young lady has brought to me as well. So before we jump in and before I let Tambria be able to give y'all that vital and awesome information that she gave me, you know, I got to start off with the statistic and some more helpful information. So according to RaisingChildren.net, talking with your baby or toddler can help their language and communication development. The more you talk with your baby or toddler, the better. So Tambria, I'm going to start this thing off on the, the probably the first question in everybody's mind. When and how do you recommend to start communicating with your little one? Ooh, I would say from the time of conception, So reason why I say that is as the child is developing in the womb, they hear all the familiar voices around them. So while they're in the womb, they're going to hear your voice. They're going to be familiar with you. They pick up language day one. Once that brain starts forming, once those nerves start moving, once the synapses start making connections, they're understanding languages, excuse me, languages. Yeah, because it could be English, Spanish, it could all of the verbal languages. So from the time of conception, all the way to the time, you know, they're still asking you in college, hey, mom, can I have $20 for pizza? (laughs) So yeah, exactly. No, I totally agree with that. And I guess, how do you recommend to start communicating with them? I think I feel like so many moms, uh, again, once or not even just moms, people in general, when seeing a child, they think that, oh, this baby hasn't developed yet. So I need to talk on their level. Like, how do you recommend to go ahead and start communicating with the little ones? So I'm going to share a funny story. When I first had my daughter, I was talking to her in like a very whisper voice. 
first time mom I, I knew nothing I just knew I just had a baby and I was like it's okay here here you go and the nurse was like you can speak louder I was like okay <laughs> um and so from there I was just like okay come on because I was nursing her I was like come on you know get on my breast or whatever and mm-hmm. and she started nursing and then from there it, it's adult language right building her sentence structure seeing the movement of my mouth even though they really technically can't really visualize us at that young mm-hmm. of an age but just having that normal regular everyday cultural communication within the home when we're out oh mommy's at the grocery store the baby can be knocked out in the car seat but they still hear us mm-hmm. so it's just important to just have that continuous um, communication with them even when you think they aren't listening mm-hmm. they are mm-hmm. yeah Yep. I totally agree with that. Thank you. So my next question is how effective is teaching a little one? I know we kind of discussed multiple languages or no matter what language that you speak, it's important to communicate with your little one. Um, But how effective is teaching your little one languages at such a young age? So it's very effective, actually. So the United States is a very monolingual culture, society. We are very focused on English, But as our country continues to expand, Spanish is now certainly going to become, if not the primary language very soon, but it is definitely almost a secondary language in Mm -hmm. the United States. Um, In other countries, many families speak three or four different languages. Mm -hmm. That's just the norm. So in the U.S., I would say for families that are wanting to introduce multiple languages at the same time, you have to remember what is the main language that you speak in your home. Mm. So if both parents or caregivers are both English speakers and you want your child to learn Spanish, if they're doing it at school or a program and they're not doing it at home, it's not necessarily translating. It needs to happen at both home and school. So caregivers and parents have to both play a role in that language learning. Um, It can't just be dependent on the school because what happens once they leave that school or that program, Mm -hmm. they're not going to use it again. Right. Yeah. So it's just important to make sure that if you are going to immerse your child in another language that is not the home language that you have to be continuous with it, meaning they have to immerse themselves in that culture as well, because language is also a part of many of our cultures. Mm. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense because I know like, for instance, in my household, uh, both dad and I are English speaking, caregiver, grandparents, like everybody's English speaking, but I've always been involved in sign language. Uh, I took a pause, but then um, I decided that he was going to be my reason why of getting back involved in it. And so even though it's not something that everyone else speaks, one thing I noticed is when they noticed um, that I was actually doing it with him, practicing with him on a constant basis. Now, if he does watch TV, it's going to be teaching him sign language. You know, um, I taught the caregiver as well as, or our nanny, as well as the grandparents, certain sign languages. I've taught dad Mm -hmm. sign language just so, like you mentioned, it is something that is consistent in his life. It's not just something he sees with mom. It's something that he sees across the board with any and everyone that he communicates with that is close to him. And even in addition to that, dad is really big on him learning Spanish because just like you said, that is going to be a predominant language very soon. And it's something that dad finds very important is he, him wanting to learn Spanish. And so Again, when it comes to watching TV or something, it's not just something for fun. It's something that you're going to learn. And now he's one years old and he literally does sign language with me. Um, And I've also noticed when I'm doing sign language, I'm speaking to him, telling him what that sign is. So now that as he's getting older, he's starting to say that word Um, or he recognizes what I'm saying to him when I'm talking and he'll sign me his response. So I think that that is awesome, especially with everything you just said. I mean, the biggest part of that is being consistent and it being across the board. Can you do the sign for daddy? Good job. What's eat? Good job. What is banana? 
What's the sign for banana? Good job. What's the sign for more? Good job. What's the sign for granddaddy? Good job, big boy. What's the sign for apple? You remember apple? All right, that's okay. What's the sign for book? Good job, good job. What's the sign for blowing a kiss? Yeah, go ahead, blow a kiss. Mwah! <laughs> good job, baby. Uh, good job. What is the sign for hello? Hey, what's the sign for hey? Hi, hi, can you wave? Good job, wave, good job. What is the sign for uh, there? Like I want that, where's there? Can you point to I want that? Yeah, good job. Give yourself a clap, clap your hands. Good job, bye-bye. So Bye -bye. I did want to ask as far as my next question, are there any challenges that can be expected when deciding to focus on communicating after one years old? Like I, I have some people that are like, you know, it's not that important before one. I, I feel differently about it. What is your take on that? Um, absolutely. Um, day one, right out the womb, uh, conception when they're when they're in the womb before they even enter into this side of the world, you know. It's important that you're continuing to push language into them. I've seen mm -hmm. it too many, too many times before when I taught in the classroom, even when I'm working with younger clients and I'm counseling, they don't have the language mm -hmm. and they don't have the language because no one's speaking to them, mm -hmm. someone's speaking at them. So they're only hearing. Mm -hmm. And that has other implications as well, because a lot of times people don't realize that their children may have a, um, an audio processing disorder. Mm. So excuse me, an auditory processing disorder. So meaning language is going in, it may not be coming out. Mm. So it, the brain may not be doing what it needs to do. And there may need to be some interventions. But a lot of these things don't become noticeable until the child is about three. And that's really when a lot of parents start to focus. And I always advocate like, hey, these are some things that I notice. And I make referrals, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, clients, whomever. I want the best for the child. Um, but definitely waiting until one is honestly too late. You've wasted a whole year of pushing language that's not there. And I just see it too often. And parents get really frustrated because they're not understanding why their one-year-old isn't communicating like their friend's one-year-old. Right. You know, and, and we try not to do it, but people compare children all the time. Ooh, yes. So a lot of it is we have to communicate with them. They have to see our mouths move. We have to get in their faces, not in a mean way, you know, but right, right. You know, get down on their level, speak to them, because if they don't see that, a lot of their oral motor mm -hmm. is not going to fully develop. And that's why you see a lot of kids when they're trying to form words later on, it's very hard for them because they haven't had good memory, meaning mm -hmm. they haven't been able to look at adult an adult that they're constantly with and see them form the words. So right. the forming of the words with the mouth is very important. So that just brings up another thing, because again, one of the shows that my son that I have him watch the lady is very detailed. She zooms in the camera to her mouth for the words or the letter that she's saying, just so you can see um, again, like, oh, and she'll just highlight, <laughs> you know, how it is or baby and, you know, her sounding it out. But I guess, again, to your point, just so you can see how it's actually articulated. It's important mm -hmm. for them to be able to see it, not just hear it, but actually see it. Uh, that makes mm -hmm. so much sense. And another thing that you brought up, which is so important, I can't stand it. I must be honest, <laughs> but 
comparing. Yes. Every child grows up differently. Mm-hmm. And we all have to recognize and realize that. And at the same time, if your child isn't developing the same way another child is, that's not that child's fault. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not that child's fault. And I, I, I won't say, I mean, depending on what it is, it could be the parent's fault. But at, at the end of the day, just please, mamas, parents, anyone listening, do not compare your child. Because again, what your child may be excelling at, another child may not be. And some challenges that your yep. challenges that your child may be dealing with, another child may be excelling. But again, as you continue to work and learn your child and appreciate who your child is, it's all going to be for the better. The love will still be the same. And you want your child to always feel love no matter how they grow up, whether they grow up with, um, you know, uh, abnormality or not, they still should be loved the same. So that just, when you said that, that just made me think about it because I know when I first had my son, um, you know, it was a situation where, you know, I had to, you know, dad and I had to have a conversation because another child friend of ours was, you know, doing a few extra things differently and totally different household. They, they're raised differently. And it's like, you know, what you're not going to do is compare. <laughs> that was from mama. Absolutely. I'm the mama. You're not going to do that. So mm-hmm. again, I just, I just don't like to see that or whatever, but um, no, those are very good points in regards to that. And so I did want to ask that kind of leads to my next thing. Cause I know I've been talking about, uh, you know, YouTube and, you know, the learning ways, different things in technology that I use to kind of help with teaching my son. And I've actually noticed some parents like myself, I will sit there with my son and we will watch a show together and we will practice on things together. But I have noticed that some parents, you know, may put a tablet or a cell phone in front of their child, even as an infant. Um, and that's pretty much that main source of how that child is learning. So mm-hmm. what would you say would be the benefits or the challenges of this method of teaching? Ooh, okay, let's see. <laughs> Juicy. <laughs> As someone who has been a very big proponent against having any form of technology, that the form of tablets, um, TV to me, because the TV is not directly in their face, a lot of times TVs are now mounted on the walls, or if they're not, they're still far enough for the child. It's not directly in their face. Mm-hmm. Um, Something that a parent, a lot of parents don't realize is if they don't turn on the night mode or nightlight on their tablet, their mm-hmm. child is consuming a lot of blue light, mm-hmm. which deteriorates your eyes over time. Mm-hmm. So that's number one. Um, it has been recommended by many organizations, many studies, any children under two and a half is not recommended. Mm-hmm. Um just in my household, I can count on my hand how many times my daughter asks for an iPad or a phone. She doesn't because I didn't really introduce that to her. Right. And I got a lot of pushback. Well, what if you're busy? What if you're doing this? I was like, she has toys that she can play with. Right. She has blocks. Um, but it definitely impacts their behavior mm-hmm. because with tablets, with even technology computers today, we don't have to wait. These kids know nothing about dial-up, okay? They don't know what it means to wait to get on the internet. Everything is instant. So if their brain is every two to three seconds, something is constantly changing, 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 changing. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we have to just keep that stimulation has to keep coming, which is fine as the child is older, like a 12-year-old sitting down, grasping something, okay, but a, a young baby, they don't have enough time to absorb it. And so now there's a lot of kid shows that are being recalled and they're looking at the scenes because the scenes have to be a certain length. Mm-hmm. And when they're, I think it's between like five or six seconds, something like that. Anything shorter than that, it's that instant gratification. So it's like, boom, 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 boom. And so now kids aren't 
really grasping information. I hear it all the time. My child ha- learned how to read with a tablet. That's awesome. However, can your child open the door knob? Excuse me, open the door. Can they turn the door knob with their hand using mm-hmm. their wrist? All of their 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 upper body motion. Can they pick up a fork and a spoon and feed themselves? Mm-hmm. Can they pick something up? Can they grasp something? And I have a lot of parents are like, what do you mean? They're going to figure out how to do that. And I'm just like, <laughs> if they don't figure out how to do it, by the time I used to get kids in pre-K, five, four and five years old, that could not feed themselves. But they could tell me every other game. And a lot of it is just how our society has now marketed to families here's a tablet here are all these educational games your child's going to learn so much but as the pandemic showed a lot of parents that that's not the case yeah we have to teach our kids Mm -hmm. the basic fundamentals and if we don't know the basic fundamentals we need to take a step back and review ourselves Mm -hmm. because I see it I see it with my, my old students. I see it with my clients. They have a hard time coping because they were never taught to go outside and play, fall and get hurt. You get up, you dust your knee off, you go. Right. You know, so they don't have coping mechanisms. And so I have to teach them. And once I teach them, they get it, they progress and they move forward. Um, it may be fast for some it may be slower for others but a lot of that it it it, it affects long term and we're seeing the effects of it the kids aren't as social mm. they don't know how to communicate um we say they text you know texting is a form of communication so i think that's very fine but that human interaction is very much lacking mm. um so it 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 does play a long term role um in their brain health their eye health Um, their physical gross motor fine motor skills if they're constantly holding a tablet like this they're not using any other range of motion if they're constantly looking up at a tv they're affecting their neck muscles and I've seen it as young as younger than one so it's 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 a little scary to see but I'm glad that we're having this conversation because a lot of people think oh it's a normal oh I'm busy I have to do this I'm just like, okay, but when do you sit down and realize something else is happening? Yeah. You know, yeah. so. And it's all about balance. Like out of everything that you just said, it's like, it's not a problem, you know, with your child, you know, using a tablet. But if that is all their time is consumed by is a tablet, yeah. then again, it, it is affecting not only, you know, their vision, but their social skills, their body. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And that's major. It's like, just have a balance, making sure that you're involving yourself. Again, getting out, playing. That's one thing that I I, I look forward to. My son, you know, I try to make sure he has this new tricycle that he has. And uh, he loves just to get out and have me push him, Mm -hmm. looking at the trees and everything. And I enjoy it too, because again, because of the pandemic, we've all been stuck in the house. And so now I have a reason to even just get out, uh, you know, embrace the day, get some vitamin D, soak up some sun, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, just balance, balance, balance. That's the big thing about all of this. (laughs) So we're not again. Oh, and I have one more. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have one more additional thing. Uh So with the tablets and the iPad, I know a lot of parents love YouTube. However, even with YouTube kids, it is not monitored as well as people think it is. Mm. So I've seen cases where, and even mine, and I had to nip that in the bud. That wasn't my fault though, but anyway, um, there's a lot of inappropriate things. Things that we probably, yeah, that we probably weren't even exposed to until middle school. Mm. so but by the time we were in middle school we had some concept of what was going on and what we were seeing a two-year-old can't really process that okay yeah and so it it turns into oh they're sneaking and I've seen it with my own daughter I've had to sit down and talk to her um because it happened she wasn't with me she was with another uh, caregiver and she had their phone Mm -hmm. and I just so happened to "Mm, it's too quiet Mm. And so I go upstairs and they have the other caregiver's phone and I was livid. I was 
not at my child, but at the caregiver, because I said, if they get your phone, you have to monitor what they're doing. Exactly. exactly. This is what you're allowing. And I established boundaries and I said, hey, I prefer them not to be on a phone mm-hmm. because X, Y, and Z. This and that and it happened and it happened multiple times. And it just got to a point where I was just I shut everything down. I was like, my child cannot have any form of technology out, outside of the sun <laughs> because it, it was it's too risky. Yeah. And we want to be careful of what we expose our children to um, just because we don't know how they're going to interpret that Mm -hmm. especially if we're not ready to have certain conversations I wasn't ready to have that kind of conversation with my Mm two-year-old you know so I explained to her you know that's not something we watch it's not appropriate and I I made it very child friendly for her age of what I expected out of her um, and as she gets older, she asks me questions and I, I answer them in the best way that I can. Um, but yeah, just be mindful of what you're allowing your kids to see, even if it's a child tablet. Yeah. There's still no telling what can pop up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard some stories. I, I have, um, you know, some friends that have told me kind of the same thing when I was pregnant. And so just like you stated that. Any and everything that my son watches, I or dad make sure to watch it first, (laughs) get that stamp of approval. And then it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. nanny, you can show this. Okay, grandparents, you can show this. Okay, you Mm -hmm. know, again, mama, daddy, you know, this is good. We talk about the shows first. Um, Again, just so we have that understanding of what it is, because even sometimes when I go back to some things I used to like as a child, I'm like, when I even go back and look, I'm like, oh, yeah. I didn't understand that back then. But now I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, this is this is kind of what y'all was doing. So, no, I definitely 100 uh, percent agree with that. 110 percent agree with you that watch what your kids are watching before you allow them to see it, because mm-hmm. it ain't safe. It ain't that safe right now. <laughs> <laughs> they, they find nah. ways to get that information into the YouTube, YouTube yes. kids. Like I know it's simple because even with my podcast, I have the ability to select uh, what categories I wanted a part of. So I can mm-hmm. choose kid friendly. I can choose, you know, this is specifically for kids. And um, it's, it's just crazy to know how simple things can get into a certain category. So mm-hmm. great tip there for, for our mamas. Be sure to tune in before you allow your kid or anybody who is watching your child to expose them to a show that you're unaware of. Now, I did want to ask, you know, we have one last question for the evening. I thank you so much for the great advice, recommendations um, for our mamas. Now, my last question is, if a mama is watching us today and they're just saying, my my child seems to have a hard time communicating with me, um, what are some suggestions or recommendations that you have for her to take? Okay, no problem. So a few recommendations are the good, friendly old Google. Um, If you are concerned, always reach out to your child's primary care physician. Mm -hmm. So whoever you go to, for their, their well checks or anything like that, seek them out first because sometimes you will need a referral to even see a speech pathologist. If not, reach out to a speech pathologist, um, set up an intake session with them um, and kind of go from there if, you, if you're thinking it's communication. Um, communication looks different. It could be fluency. Um, it could be articulation. They're not necessarily getting the words out the way they should be. It could be an auditory processing disorder where it's going in, but it's not necessarily coming out mm. or it's coming out, but it's not, it's not always registering. Um, it could be, you may need to go to um, an audiologist and have their hearing checked. Mm. Um, and you can typically find audiologists in um, ENT. So ear, nose and throat doctors offices. Sometimes they work in there. Sometimes they have private practices. Um, But just any form of communication, if your child is in school, speak to their teacher, speak to the account, anyone that interacts with them outside of being with you, speak to them, get a little bit of feedback, Um, be very open to that feedback, because you don't want to hear my, your child doesn't communicate and and we have some challenges, you know, and other, no one wants to hear that, but it's better to hear it now 
then they're all the way in high school and now all of these things are coming to light and the older they are the harder it is to get them help so go to your primary seek out a speech pathologist or an audiologist maybe you may need both um but at the end of the day just love on your child and keep talking to them and tell them you love them exactly i know that's right look that's a great way to end this be sure to tell your child every day that you love them as they continue to grow you know again embracing them and just letting them feel the love and hear it from you as well and so tambria i just want to thank you so much again for taking out the time to be a part of i'm the mama podcast today you have provided us some helpful insight on the importance of communicating with our little ones, as well as how to be able to communicate with our little ones. So again, thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And y'all know I have to give the inspirational quote of the day, which is perfect for today's topic. I want you to know that a mother is clothed with strength and dignity, laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. That's from Proverbs, okay, about your mamas, okay? And so I want to thank you all for taking out the time to listen today. I want to be sure that you have the opportunity to like, follow, share, and subscribe, and comment. This has been some very helpful information that, again, when sharing, you don't know who this could actually help. So I appreciate you sharing the content And so that we can continue to build upon each other, help each other, create a safe space to learn and to discuss topics such as these. Uh, Again, I, I, I can't wait until we go into our next episode, which again, y'all know I try to keep it on point with what we're talking about and keep it real with you. And so I realized that not every household has both parents and that's okay. There is no problem with that. So with the next episode, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on the importance of good co-parenting. I think so many times we hear about negative things when it comes to co-parenting and who isn't doing what. And so again, that goes hand in hand with communication. All right. And so we're going to talk to uh, a mother that is experiencing and going to be providing us good co-parenting tips and what she has been experiencing within her child's first life. And so make sure to tune in. Again, this is a safe space for the mom but it's also for the dads, those who are looking to have kids, uh, or those who just want to find out a little bit more about the journey of motherhood. So until next time, I want to make sure that you are keeping your head up because your little one is always looking up to you, admiring you. Continue to tune in to I'm the Mama podcast. I'm your host, Ashley L. Continue to take care and we'll see you next time on I'm the Mama podcast. Have a great one.